Good morning, everyone. I'm Chris Wood, editor and publisher of Biz West, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Commercial Real Estate Impact, What Landlords and Tenants Should Know. It's the latest installment in Biz West's Coping with COVID-19 webinar series. As the title suggests, today's webinar will explore the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the commercial real estate sector. Commercial real estate has been heavily affected by the economic downturn, with some tenants struggling to make payments, some landlords working with tenants on rent relief, and with lenders negotiating workout agreements with landlords. But experts in the field are looking down the road to anticipate what forces might continue to affect commercial real estate, including potential litigation over unpaid rents and foreclosure. Our expert panel will walk us through these issues. Before we begin, I would like to thank our sponsors for today's program, Berg Hill, Greenleaf and Rashidi, Int Credit Union, and Whipfleet. Our panel today brings a wide range of experience and expertise to the topic of real estate from the legal, accounting, and banking sectors. Damien Ederhoff is a certified public accountant with more than 30 years of construction and real estate accounting experience. He has expertise with assurance, tax and consulting engagements for companies in all stages of business. This combined experience allows Damien the ability to provide his clients with holistic consulting in areas such as succession planning and mergers and acquisitions. Damien regularly attends key construction related conferences and events in addition to presenting on contractor operational best practices. Mark Changaris is a partner with Berg Hill, Greenleaf, and Rashidi. His practice centers on assisting clients in a broad array of complex business matters, including construction law, intellectual property, litigation, and mergers and acquisitions. As part of his construction law practice, he has assisted owners, contractors, subcontractors, and suppliers in connection with a wide variety of projects. He has worked on residential developments, industrial facilities, maintenance structures, mining infrastructure, and school construction, with projects ranging from several million dollars up to multi-billion dollar budgets. And Gary McDonald is a business banker with Int Credit Union. He joined Int as a business banker in 2020 and has 24 years of commercial banking experience. Gary's consultative style and customer-centric focus has led to a long career in financial services, serving clients he has assisted multiple times through various growth cycles. And now we are going to begin. I do want to encourage the audience to use the Q&A function of Zoom to submit questions. Please do that throughout the program and we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentations. And right now I will turn it over to Damien. Hello, everyone. Um, sorry about that. Took a second. I had to screen share. Um, thank you for having me aboard. Uh, look forward to taking a few minutes of your time to talk about where real estate is and some of the impacts. Obviously, not be not able to go through all the impacts, but we should be able to go through most of them. So, um, again, my name's Damian Ederhoff, and I'm going to go ahead and <clears throat> kind of move forward and say, where did we start this thing? The beginning, you know, back in March, we ended up finding out businesses were shut down, create, creating an immediate disruption in how things were being done. Employees were being sent home to work remotely. And some of the challenges both tenants and operators had was that were their, were their employees able to work from home? Were they set up to work from home from not only supplies, computers, screens, um, internet ac access, uh, you know, space to work. So it became very challenging to keep things on the move as these things were happening in such uh, high speed. And, and what came out of it was a lot of uncertainty as to, man, how long is this going to last? And, and that was really tricky for people. And nobody knew the answer. And then as we move towards where we're at now, you know, tenants, what did they have to do? They had to develop a plan as things started to reopen and on bring so that they could bring and or offer their employees the option to return to work. 
So they had to make the environment safe. They had to incorporate the rules, the, the social distancing. And what did that mean to their office space? You know, what were they going to do with cafeteria space? And what was their obligation and, and commitment to their employees to make sure it was safe for them to be back? Hand sanitizers, how we, how we move through the, the hallways, do we wear masks, do we don't? And, and those things were very, very challenging for tenants that had never had to do this and, op, you know, businesses to do this in the, in the, in the past. Landlords doing the same thing had to develop their plan as to how do we reopen our, our buildings and create a safe environment for our tenants to be willing to come back into it. And so what were we going to do with our open areas and our common areas, our fitness centers? If we had cafeterias, what were we going to do there? And how we're going to manage elevators? I mean, it went on and on and they had the same thing, disinfecting hand sanitizers. How much do you put out? Where do you put it out? And so, you know, that was a challenging uh, time and still is for landlords to, to get tenants, to get their employees back into their buildings. And in doing all of that, tenants and landlords also had to you know, navigate and, and evaluate what the cost and logistics of operating under this new normal of how their building has to be run. And so it was very, very, very time consuming and unknown for those people is how is the best way to attract their tenants back into the buildings and tenants attracting their employees back into the office. And so, and I think one of the biggest challenges they, they both had when it comes down to we move to remote working is how do, we rem how do we manage our employees and our operations and their productivity and output under this new return to work slash remote working environment? It's very difficult to when you have people spread out throughout, you know, the city or the upper uh, across the front range, we're, we're where are my people? How are they? How are we communicating? All those things. And so that was a real challenge for these uh, <clears throat> tenants and or operators and landlords. And so, you know, when you look to the future, they're going to have to continue to learn how to work under this new norm. And how do we best produce the product that we're trying to produce with, with this new environment where we don't aren't able to bring everybody back in the office. Uh, I know many of us would like that to happen, but it isn't likely to happen in the near term. Um, I think what we're gonna see going forward is gonna be vacancies likely to double by 2020. Right now, probably in the 10 to 15% range will be somewhere we're thinking 20 to 20, 30% as the market shifts from favoring landlords to tenants. And so you might have tenants now looking to sublease and use the sublease market. Um, how much space will they need? Uh, if we're going to social distance our desks and our workspace, what does that look like? Um, if we've just recently renovated into an open collaborative, open air uh, work environment, how is that going to work under this new coronavirus uh, environment? So do we go back to the traditional office space? And so those are going to be challenges that are going to come forward in the future. We, we, we believe, and have been told, talking to various brokers, they believe that rates will drop because it's going to a tenant favoring market, $3 to $5 per square foot on average. And so that'll be interesting to see what happens in the event of that and how landlords adjust for that change in square footage. Um, also, I think we will talk about later in the banking area, but, you know, rent release is re <coughs> relief is going to increase by prob probably about 50%. And that's going to be, is it deferring rents, um, paying, uh, giving free rent and tacking it on to the end of the amortization of the lease term. Um, you're also seeing uh, extensions to leases that are coming near term to one year extensions to see how things go. That hasn't been seen in years, if ever. And so those are the interesting things I think you're gonna see with the rent and, and how, how lenders <coughs> or uh, uh, landlords are gonna work with tenants. And that's gonna be negotiating their lease terms, extending them out for uh, you know, X amount of months as they work through this environment. So those will be interesting, uh, <coughs> uh, 
terms that come up in the future and what they will be. Um, the re <clears throat> return to wor work is highly dependent, I believe, uh, on a vaccination. If, if employees want to come back, they want to feel safe to come back to work. And if you want to get most of your employees back to work, there's got to be some, uh, you know, uh, confidence from your employees that it's safe to do that. And I think a vaccination is the huge piece of that formula. And then in, in, in on a positive note, if you look at the Rockies, we, we, are, we had a strong environment going into this. We still have a pretty strong environment now, and we are still very attractive to the coastal cities, which are becoming so outrageously expensive to operate and to house their people, that the Rocky Mountain region is still very, very, very well looked at, and there are many companies looking to move here in the near term, even in the uh, environment we're in. So we're, we're fortunate that the Rockies are, are, are an attractive place, uh, that it's 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 still operating at a pretty high standard, and I think NIAP even put out you know on a survey they did that it interested me, but it was you know over eighty percent of the landlords indicated that their tenants are paying their rent still on time and in full. So those are those are some positive notes that we see going into the future. All right, thank you, Damien. I uh, really appreciate that overview of where we've been and, and uh, potentially where we're going. And right now I'm going to turn it over to Mark. All right, apologies, I had a little difficulty on muting. Um, thanks everyone for uh, being here today. I'm gonna be giving a brief overview of some of the legal trends we've seen as a result of uh, this dynamic, uh, huge disruptive force that we call COVID-19. Um, one of the things that Damien spoke about, I think it, it is important because it also impacts the legal uh, issues that uh, landlords and, and tenants are facing. And that is, we have two kind of driving forces. Uh, one of which is tenants are struggling um, financially, which puts uh, burdens on the bottom line, which also puts very real practical considerations in terms of the tenant's ability to satisfy lease obligations uh, that were previously uh, thought of as being affordable. And the second is uh, tenants' business needs are shifting. And uh, when I say the business needs are shifting, as many businesses who previously uh, saw real value in bricks and mortar offices, either through prestige or through um, the need for collaborative work environments are, are seeing a shift in working remotely actually changing their paradigm in terms of where is the value add for some of this commercial leasing, uh, commercial uh, office space. And you're, we're seeing those two forces uh, come together in a confluence of events to put real pressure on landlords to proactively address the changing landscape. And so what we're seeing in terms of some current trends are um, a tendency to try to work with tenants uh, to keep the tenants in the building alive and, and thriving. Um, and so what we're seeing are questions from landlords and tenants relating to what kind of rent abatement can we negotiate? And rent abatement is taking uh, a variety of forms. One of those forms is, um, uh, either forgiveness of rent in total for a specific period of time, or as Damien mentioned, adding rent in at the end and simply doing a rent deferment. Other potential alternatives are reductions in the rental rates, the base rental rates. Uh, and then, um, you know, obviously there's the discussion of what, if you're dealing with a triple net lease, what happens with operating costs? You know, do you maybe have a holiday in terms of the base rent? but uh, allow for operating costs to also be paid by the tenant uh, so that the you know, landlord isn't stuck essentially paying, paying uh, to operate the building uh, during this time period. Um, other concessions that we've seen uh, that have been asked for and that are commonly come up are waiver of rent escalation provisions. Um, you know, many leases have built in rent escalation provisions and uh, one potential tool in the arsenal of negotiation is to 
adjust those uh, rent escalation provisions to provide some value and, and to try to incentivize the tenant to continue to honor the lease obligations. Um, and then another uh, component, which we have not seen a, a ton of, but I think it does come up from time to time is if, if you've got a situation where a tenant is either not paying the lease and, uh, or is not able to perform, uh, you don't have a strong guarantor and the uh, tenant itself is pretty much a shell or is bankruptcy proof, then um, uh, it, there can be some value to negotiating a voluntary lease termination agreement pursuant to which basically the premises get handed back over in lieu of uh, time consuming and expensive litigation regarding the eviction process. Um, these are some current trends that we're seeing in, in connection with how uh, commercial landlords are, are trying to be proactive and address the situations. What we also see in the background is the threat of litigation from tenants. And uh, what that basically comes down to is there are some legal doctrines that have developed over, uh, over the years um, that uh, deal with impossibility and impracticability. And these legal doctrines, uh, the tenant can use as a potential leverage tool to threaten uh, landlords with litigation in the event that uh, you aren't able to negotiate a compromise. These doctrines uh, are sparsely applied um, and uh, basically won't dive into and get into the weeds, but um, for impossibility to apply the changed circumstances must render the promise vitally different from the contemplation of the parties. It basically has to be a frustration, uh, an unexpected event that causes a frustration of one of the core economic assumptions. And um, mere financial difficulty, economic hardship is not enough. And courts are very reluctant to apply these doctrines, although they do exist and they are kind of a flashpoint. A related doctrine is the frustration of purpose doctrine which is where uh, there can be total or near total destruction of an essential purpose of the transaction without fault of the party asserting the defense. And uh, the change must be to a core component, primary component of the deal that's an essential purpose of the contract that makes one party's performance virtually worthless to the other. Now, how would these doctrines apply? The, you know, each fact is a little bit different, but for instance, if you were uh, a tenant in a gym membership or a, a lease of a gym facility, if there were perhaps restrictions in place that rendered it impossible for you to operate your gym as a result of government prohibitions on large gatherings. Uh, and you could argue that this COVID-19 is a change in circumstances that makes your provision of the premises landlord uh, basically worthless to me because I can't use it in my uh, intended purpose. And as a result, I should be uh, allowed to avoid uh, the uh, terms of the lease. Now, these are state common law type doctrines. And so they vary state to state and they are generally recognized in most of the states. But um, as I indicated, courts are reluctant to apply these doctrines because courts have a, a great respect for the written contract and they view common law doctrines with suspicion to the extent that they try to um, essentially frustrate the contractual expectations of the parties. Um, one, one particular case I thought worth mentioning, there are not very many cases that have dealt with COVID-19. Um, I think that is a function of uh, a variety of factors, one of which is this is a relatively new event and uh, the courts have not had an opportunity to catch up. I think the court shutdowns have also impacted this. And I also think that many tenants have been able to limp along either through PPP or through some other funding sources and uh, the shoe has not fallen, so to speak, on litigation with landlords regarding um, enforceability of commercial leases and these doctrines. Uh, Backel Hospitality Group is a relatively recent case. It was just decided, I believe, in August of this year. It's a New York Supreme Court case, and uh, it's a little misleading. Supreme Court is the trial court. It's the lower level court in New York. It's not the highest court, so it's not of huge precedential value. But in this case, the tenant sought to avoid a lease on the basis of impossibility, and the trial court rejected the tenant's arguments essentially relying on a provision in the lease that said if uh, 
there is a change or a governmental prohibition that renders us unable to collect rent, then um, that basically gets held in escrow. And then once that restriction's lifted, you will owe that uh, rent to the landlord. And the trial court held that that lease provision basically trumped the common law defense and, and basically ruled that the, the tenant was out of luck on that particular defense. And I, I pointed this out, one, because it's one of the few cases that has addressed address this issue in the context of COVID-19, but it also underscores the uphill battle that tenants face when they're trying to invoke these common law doctrines. Another uh, major uh, issue that needs to be explored when you're dealing with these issues are force majeure provisions. They vary by lease and can take many forms, and so every provision needs to be closely scrutinized. Um, many do not contain language that would be broad enough to trigger COVID-19 events. Some do, some may trigger, some may contain language that deals with governmental restrictions, which could arguably be triggered. Uh, and so it, it is really important it, on either side, if you're a tenant or if you're a landlord, to really dig into the force majeure provisions. And then um, of course, bankruptcy is going to be a common threat uh, with tenants, especially if, if uh, the economic uh, consequences of, unable, of being unable to conduct business in a meaningful fashion continue. And uh, bankruptcy is going to be on the table. And so in conclusion, um, I would like to kind of end with uh, you know, some, some thoughts many commercial landlords may be asking, how do I protect myself given these uncertainties? And I think there are some concrete steps that landlords can take. Um, there is going to be inherent risk no matter what because we're dealing with a global pandemic. But uh, some steps that a, a commercial landlord can take include um, asking for more robust guarantees and asking for more guarantors. Uh, and um, that's a very common sense approach but basically the more guarantors you can get on the hook for a particular lease, the greater the likelihood that uh, you will be able to exert leverage to ensure that the lease obligations are um, dealt with and, and addressed in a meaningful manner. Um, another approach is to really robustly review your lease and add in provisions similar to the one that we discussed in the New York case and add in provisions to protect uh, yourself in the event of a COVID-19 issue and specifically clarify the allocation of risk. Uh, robust lease terms can really go a long way because courts are, are very prone to enforce lease provisions. And um, if that does, uh, in addition to those two items, if, if you are very concerned about the ability of a tenant to perform its lease obligations, there are financial uh, institutions and sureties that can um, draft and provide you what's called a standby letter of credit, which can be obtained. And basically in the context of a standby letter of credit, uh, the issuer of the standby letter of credit would step in and perform the tenant's lease obligations in the event of a default. Uh, and the downside of that approach is there's obviously cost associated with lining that up and there's obviously time. So uh, to briefly summarize, I would say, there is a great amount of uncertainty on the legal uh, horizon. It will be interesting to see how these legal issues shuffle out as litigation starts to come down the pike. But there are steps that commercial landlords can take to proactively manage the risk and to address this crisis in a meaningful manner. And so with that, thank you very much. And we have questions lined up at the end, but if you have any specific questions, don't hesitate to email me, my email address is uh, on this slide. Thank you very much, Mark, for that excellent overview of the legal aspects of commercial real estate in this environment. And uh, I do want to remind the audience, you can use the Q&A tool of Zoom to submit questions. We do have quite a few questions that were submitted as part of the registration process, but we can certainly take additional questions today and we will get to as many of those as possible. And right now, I will turn it over to Gary. Gary, if you could uh, remember to unmute and share your video. Thanks, Chris. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, letting me be a part of this presentation. Um, as Chris mentioned, I'm with Ent Credit Union. Uh, let me just start with a little uh, introduction of who we are um, to kind of portray who we are in the marketplace. Um, if you are from Colorado Springs or have familiarity with Colorado Springs, you would have heard of us. 
End Credit Union was started in 1957. Uh, it's named after a major general, Ent, and there was an Ent Air Force Base. Uh, that property is currently occupied by the Olympic Center. Uh, but we've been primarily down in the Colorado Springs area until just the beginning of this year. Uh, I'm at the Fort Collins branch that opened up in January, or I'm just about a month or two ago. Uh, and from there, we're gonna open up service centers in um, additional ones in Fort Collins. We're gonna be in Loveland, Windsor, Timnath, um, soon to be Greeley, um, and long-term uh, Boulder. So we operate in the same areas that commercial banks operate. We have a business banking unit, which I'm a member of. Uh, we also have a corporate banking group. So we're doing pretty much the same things that commercial banks are doing. Uh, we're seeing owner-occupied properties, we're seeing investment properties, et cetera. So a wide variety of properties. We operate differently than a commercial bank because we're not for profit. So we try to um, share our, um, our fees uh, the reduction of fees with the members. It's kind of like being a member of a, of a utility co-op. Uh, we're sharing the profits with members as opposed to shareholders. Um, with that being said, we're in the market. Um, like I said, we're expanding throughout Colorado, starting with Northern Colorado. We should have about 15 service centers in the next couple of years. So as some financial institutions are kind of retrenching, we're actually expanding, so it's it's uh, refreshing to be on that end of it. Um, as far as loan loss reserves, as you probably have heard, a lot of the lenders are setting aside loan loss reserves. Um, the six largest lenders in the country have set aside 36 billion in loan loss reserves. So a lot of the financial lending institutions are kind of preparing on you know what might happen uh, in the future. Um, that being said, the main thing you can do to work with your lender is communicate. It's interesting through COVID, so many different businesses, so many different industries are so different. Some of them are actually thriving. Some of them are um, just about the same as they were last year. Some of them are having a lot of difficulties. So the number one thing that we can say is if you have questions, if you have concerns, communicate with your lender. Uh, a lot of loan payments are being deferred, but we're basically working with our clients, our members on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, I would speculate that as you work with tenants, landlords, I would suspect that a lot of the landlords would prefer to keep existing tenants in place as opposed to finding new people. But of course, it depends on that business. Is it retail? Is it restaurant? Are they struggling? How are they gonna make their payments? So again, ultimately it comes down to what the lenders are doing for the, the landlord, but we work with them individually um, on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, otherwise, on a global scale, it's uh, like I said, we've, we've had a variety of different perspectives. What's interesting and what's optimistic is we are having a lot of developers, um, real estate investors coming to us, they're buying properties. So in a time when you would think that everybody would be on the sidelines, we are seeing quite a bit of opportunity to bid on loans for investment properties. What you're seeing with existing owner-occupied properties is a lot of business owners are trying to refinance, they're trying to bring their interest rates down, they're trying to do whatever they can to make their balance sheet and p &L more efficient. And um, not only on the business side, but also on, on their personal side, we're seeing a lot of business owners not only refinance their commercial loans, but they're also refinancing their home mortgages, their home equity lines of credit, their auto loans, so basically everybody is kind of doing what they did in the Great Recession. They're trying to make their bottom line as efficient as they can, kind of retrench as best they can. And it's always impressed me with business owners. They're very creative. They find ways to um, um, diversify and adapt. Um, a lot of them have the slogan, adapt or die. Uh, you've seen the restaurants. 
they've expanded into the parking lots with their spaces. So uh, they're a creative uh, bunch and we love seeing what, what they have on, uh, on the horizon. All right, Gary, thank you very much. And we will begin q and I'll remind the audience you can use the Q&A tool, but uh, we have a, a lot of questions that have been submitted in advance. And I think I will uh, uh, start with you, Gary, and then uh, Mark and, and Damien can chime in if you, uh, if you choose. But I'm wondering, you were talking about some landlords working with, uh, I'm sorry, lenders working with landlords. And I'm wondering what are some examples of how lenders are working for landlords? I think you mentioned, you alluded to uh, perhaps lowering uh, uh, interest rates, but what, what are landlords, uh, what are lenders doing right now to work with landlords and keep these loans in, in good standing? So Gary, I'll, I'll start that with, uh, with you. Sure. Um, I, I, uh, and I, it was interesting listen, listening to Damien's presentation because it seems like a long time ago, March, but it's only been six months ago. Anyway, one of the first things that people were doing was they were asking for loan deferments. Um, we we charged zero fees during March and April. So we were doing everything we could, not only for property owners, but also members in general to try and help them in the near term. And then in the long term, you know, what's the situation going to look like? Um, underwriting new loans or new refinance opportunities for us, we look at it a little differently on the underwriting side than we typically have. What I mean by that is we were looking more in the rear view mirror in terms of what they were doing in the past. And this year, it seems strange to say, but this year, you know, we know it's a very unusual circumstance, but we don't really factor in as heavily this year as we typically do. So we're looking at existing leases that they have in place. We're looking at their their past performance. And But Chris, to answer your question, I would say the number one thing we're doing for real estate owners is uh, deferring their payments down the road. All right, great. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Damon, do you have thoughts on that, on what, uh, what you, you're seeing on the lender side of things? Most of the tenants are, uh, or customers we're working with, they're, they're doing exactly what Gary said. They're getting, you know, delayed payments. They're getting skip payments and adding it to the end of the, the term or renegotiating the current terms to extend them out. A lot of the owners, unlike in the past, are not leveraged when they went into these buildings at the 90%. They were fairly well uh, uh, lever uh, equalized. And so there's plenty of equity in them. So they're able to withstand some of this uh, times of where they're struggling. But the, the nice thing about the market currently that we're seeing is again, the, the underlying number of landlords, most are getting paid. And it's been helpful that, you know, tenants have been able to bring their people back into the office. And so that's helped them continue to operate at, at least a break even and pay off their operating expenses, which includes their loan payments. All right, thank you, Damien. And Mark, uh, your thoughts on that question? Sure, I think uh, there have been a, a variety of, of ways that um, people have been dealing with concessions, but I think from a broader trend perspective, one of, the, one of the things I think is interesting is that there's going to be winners and losers in this. And I think some of the losers in this particular area are going to be tenants that are undercapitalized and can't take advantage of the, the deals in the market right now. And I think we're seeing with deeper pocket uh, tenants, large corporations and large companies that have been able to secure uh, rental rates uh, in large markets that would otherwise not be able to be obtained um, for relative bargains. And, um, you know, we see, you know, there was an article, I think, uh, yesterday, um, uh, that NPR put out regarding, you know, some uh, aggressive leasing in the New York area um, by uh, large companies that are taking advantage of the kind of um, the market conditions. And so I think that will be interesting to see how that shakes out. 
Great, thank you, Mark. And uh, Damien, if I could ask you to turn your, your video on. I, I wanna have a, a, I have a follow up question. I've heard from a, a large commercial landlord that they are getting inquiries from their bank requesting information of various sorts about their, about their business operations. And I'm wondering, uh, is that occurring uh, in, uh, also for, for landlords who may be on time on their payments? Are banks still going to those landlords that may be making those payments on their mortgages? but the, the lender might want uh, some additional information. Is that, is that happening? And, and if so, why? And how are, how are lending institutions being proactive in trying to secure information about their portfolios? And uh, yeah, Gary, I might uh, start with you. Sure. Um, I haven't seen that on our end. Um, like Damien was saying, a lot of the, um, a lot of people have equity. We don't um, offer SBA loans. We are more conservative. So when somebody buys a building, we're looking for 20% 20, 20 as a minimum down payment. Uh, we stay in touch with our members uh, frequently, but I haven't had any experience where we're proactively reaching out and making them supply more information um, prior to when things are coming due. Mark, are you seeing anything there? No, I've, I'm seeing more robust uh, underwriting on the front end, um, but not for, for loans that are in um, that have already been issued. I'm, I'm not seeing any any particular you know additional kicking of the tires or requests for additional collateral. We've had some issues with respect to loan renewals and um, and obviously some additional questions that come up in that context. But um, generally, if the loan's performing. Uh, we haven't seen any, any any lenders coming around asking questions. All right, and uh, uh, Damien, I want to ask you. I want to get at the the general outlook for mixed use properties. And this was a question submitted during the registration process by one of our attendees. Uh, what is the general outlook for filling mixed use properties? As there have been a high level of retail vacancies even prior to 2020, and of course we know the retail apocalypse began far. Uh, long before COVID-19 hit, and it has only accelerated since then. But we also have, uh, of course, major challenges in hospitality and office. And uh, Damien, I might uh, toss that to you first, uh, uh, the general outlook for filling these properties. And, and Damien, again, if you could uh, turn on your video. Yeah, Chris, it says that the host is preventing me to start the video, so I don't know why that is. Okay, we'll uh, we'll have him look at that. So uh, just uh, go ahead. We'll we'll deal with audio here until we. Yeah, I think the mixed uses. Uh, I mean, you get to where you're talking real estate or the uh, retail and hospitality, uh, the areas. They are getting it beat up more than anyone in this whole environment, uh, due to the fact that they were shut down completely and they rely on table turnover. And they now, when they come back to work, they have to you know space them to the point where they can only turn over half the number of tables uh, in, in a day in an hour that they used to and you know they live on a, on a light mar a thin margin anyway so I think you're going to see the mixed use uh, really reinvent itself going forward and when it comes back full scale you're going to see a lot of new names that aren't out there today and you're going to see a lot of names that don't come back and then I think it's going to be both in retail and hospitality. Uh, the, the, the mixed use part, the residential side, you know, that the above, uh, that space multifamily seems to still be carrying its weight. We're seeing properties still being acquired. And so I think that's kind of where we see that mixed use property uh, going in the future. Great, Damien. And your video is back. So that's been resolved. And uh, that's, Gary. That's, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Gary, uh, uh, same question to you, kind of the general outlook for, for these different market segments. Um, I would say that's not typically an area that we focus on. Um, we have worked with retail investor properties that might be occupied by, say, a large national firm. Um, something like that is, is uh, something that you can get a long-term lease from. Um, but as far as setting up a, a development that's made up of several retail tenants, that's typically not a space that we work with. Uh, we do work with investment real estate, but it's more um, a commercial property that's occupied by maybe 
one to three tenants versus like a mall or that kind of a thing. All right, uh, Mark, any thoughts that there on the, uh, the general outlook for the different market segments? You know, I think uh, a lot of the changes are still being felt in um, the, you know, the, so to speak, the boat that is the commercial real estate market is slow to turn. Um, I do think there's going to be some downward pressure on lease rates. And I also think perhaps as, um, as some of the impacts to local municipalities and governments are, are felt, there could be some downward pressure on uh, property taxes and valuations as a result of that. Although I think that's long in the pipeline. All right, great. We have a, a question that's just been submitted by a member of the audience and I'm going to uh, read this first and I'll probably uh, direct this to, to uh, each of you, but I'll probably start with Gary. The question is, why aren't banks looking at the new market value of commercial properties and adjusting accordingly? Tenants can't afford old lease rates. If a landlord uh, doesn't want, uh, my question disappeared here, uh, hold on. If a landlord doesn't want vacancies, they need to negotiate with the bank so they can pass the new market rates to tenants. The financial burden currently is falling solely on small business. So uh, Gary, I guess the question is, if a, if a property is getting, if, if lease rates are declining, vacancies are increasing, a property may not be worth what it was when a mortgage was signed, so why, why don't banks, uh, financial institutions, just adjust that value accordingly and, and take the hit? Yeah, I guess there would be an example of case by case. Um, obviously, I would suspect in most cases, the landlord would wanna keep existing tenants in there, but each of them are so different. Um, you know, that might be an opportunity for um, a landlord to have a tenant that has a longer term lease or a more stable income. Um, but our relationship is with the, the landlord, not with the tenants per se. Uh, if we're working with tenants, then that would be like operating lines of credit or um, specific business loans for them. And we would work with them individually. But typically, if it's an investment property, we're going to be working with the landlord, not, not the tenant. All right, great. And uh, Damien, you provided some data that's pretty sobering in terms of vacancies potentially doubling or, or tripling, uh, lease rates uh, decreasing. If all of that comes to pass, it would stand to reason that uh, litigation and potential foreclosures might increase down the road as well. If, if lease rates are declining and um, uh, if uh, vacancies are increasing, then the landlord will not have all of that revenue to be paying on uh, on mortgages. So, what what is the outlook there in terms of uh, what that all means? What do these uh, uh, increasing vacancies and decreasing lease rates? Uh, what does that say about what might be coming down the road? I think you're going to see exactly what that participant is asking: is why are they not getting you know revised uh, for square footage prices? I think eventually that's going to have to come. I think for the most part, a lot of these uh, landlords or owners have pretty good equity, like I said earlier. And if they're good, good, they have a bunch of good tenants, they're going to work pretty heavily in keeping them and allowing even subleasing and some things to allow the tenant. If you look at it, the tenant just defers its payments. You know, it really doesn't get any relief. It just gets it pushed to the future where the landlord ends up being, you know, fully covered. By, by nature of just getting all of their payments so they don't have any exposure to, for the most part, if you looked at it that way. But I do think landlords are gonna find themselves having to readjust what they're putting out as a product from the design of it all the way to the cost of per square foot, which means that the lenders, or the, uh, lenders are gonna have to also you know, adjust to those new terms and, and possibly work out a renegotiation of their debt. Thanks, Damien. And uh, Mark, we have seen, uh, we've started to see a couple of lawsuits where landlords are suing tenants for unpaid rent. We're, I've, I've seen a couple of those in the, in the Boulder market just, just this week. And I'm wondering, uh, will, do you expect that we will see more on, on that litigation side from the landlords to, to tenants? 
And then on the lender side, the potential for foreclosures. No one wants to see foreclosures, but we started to see a few here in, in our region. And uh, a lot of people are saying there, there likely will be more a few months down the road. So I'm, I'm curious as to the outlook from your perspective on potential litigation from uh, landlords to tenants, and you mentioned the reverse as well, but also uh, potential for foreclosures. Yeah, I, I think that there, there certainly is going to be an uptick if, um, if nothing more than uh, landlords seeking demands for possession, uh, if they've got tenants that are not voluntarily leaving. Um, I think to the extent that uh, you have a well, uh, you know, a well-financed tenant who um, has reserves and you have uh, guarantees in place, I think there's a strong financial incentive for tenants to do everything that they can not to default. It's when things start getting desperate that you see uh, litigation being um, the tool of last resort for landlords to um, enforce their rights. And we, we are seeing an uptick on that. On the foreclosure side, I think foreclosures obviously have some real drawbacks. Um, and I, I think they are a tool of last resort for a variety of reasons. And what I'm seeing, at least right now, is the capital markets have not degraded to such an extent that you can't find buyers in the private market. And so although they may be buzzards, uh, so to speak, um, and opportunistic, um, where there are pennies on the dollar type offers, um, it is, you know, you might take a 90, 90 cents on the dollar selling to somebody uh, uh, in, a, in a very short fashion than letting a property go to foreclosure and taking 40 or 50 cents on the dollar. And so right now there, there's enough money that I think is, that has been on the sidelines and, and opportunistic investors that um, I'm seeing that more as a, an available off ramp and um, especially for larger commercial properties than pushing them into foreclosure. But I think that can change if uh, capital markets get strapped and if, um, buyers aren't willing to take on the risk of, of these properties. And uh, Mark, and, oh, go ahead, please. I'd agree, Mark. And I think, you know, if you look at it with the vacancies, like we anticipate or seem to be hearing doubling by 2022, which I think was a misprint on the, on my slide, it said 2020, but by 2022, I think right now you're not seeing a lot of that adjustment from a lender standpoint. They're just trying to work with them currently. But if that does a pan out and that does happen where we double there's going to have to be like it, there always is in a market downturn some some flexibility being provided by lenders if you ask me all right thank you damien i'm, I'm wondering uh, uh damien or mark or, or gary uh, uh any of you have you seen a difference with your clients have you seen a difference in terms of tenants that are big national or global companies <laughs> and how they handle their lease payments compared to maybe small and medium-sized companies. I, I've heard anecdotally that even some big companies have been trying to use this as leverage to re renegotiate their leases, or in some cases have not been, been paying. And that was uh, the case with apparently with uh, a lawsuit story that we wrote uh, here this week. I'm just wondering, what, what are you seeing? Is there a difference, uh, a tangible difference between those big national and global companies and and what the small and medium companies are are doing um uh, market I would offer that i don't i wouldn't think i don't think I, we don't see or i don't see and and i could you know not not have the entire vision of all the people within our firm but i i don't see a big difference i think those businesses are astute enough to know and they act and respond accordingly to no no regardless of their size and what their uh, outreach is globally or locally. Okay, um, uh, Mark or Gary, any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I would um, tend to agree with, with Damien. I think uh, I, I think what I have seen is if you have deeper pockets, it gives more flexibility. Um, and I have seen potential uh, using as a negotiating tactic um, larger upfront payments uh, to negotiate cheaper rent in the long haul. Um, to the extent landlords are cash strapped and, and uh, tenant has the ability to do so. Um, but I haven't seen a huge disparity between, between the two groups. Yeah, and on our side, uh, we typically don't have the large national firm as um, 
as a borrower, um, they're typically the, the tenant. So for example, if you have a, a retail space that's up, occupied by say a Verizon store, it's actually beneficial a lot of times because they're willing to sign a longer term lease, maybe a 10 year, 15, et cetera, lease. Um, but we typically don't deal with the large national firms as uh, borrowers. You know, and I, I would, I would add that I, I wonder how banks are when, when you have a, a very strong client and or landlord as, as a lender, why would you not, lend some for you know some relief to those lenders or those uh, ten, uh, landlords because there is a lot of uncertainty for the next 18 months and the more you can can adapt to what they don't know yet i think long term is going to commit some some uh you know loyalty in, in that that landlord which is never a bad thing for a lender yeah exactly um we don't have a workout group um we work directly with the, the borrowers, um, the business bankers, the corporate bankers. So we want to, like I said, there's so many different cases. We work on a case by case basis. Some businesses um, remember are doing very, very well, but some of them are struggling. So we, we strive to work with each individual borrower um, because we want to be in it for the long run. The last thing we want to do is, um, you know, like Mark was saying, the last thing, uh, a borrower wants to do is go into foreclosure and then that's the last thing a lender wants. So we want to work with them. Um, a lot of this I feel hasn't happened yet. We're kind of taking this day by day or month by month. You know, for example, residential real estate is very, very strong. Commercial real estate is still holding. We're seeing people selling properties, buying properties. We're not really seeing the decline yet. Um, I think it's coming, but we just we're we're looking at it as it as it comes um you know like like damien was saying the expectation is for things to to head south in the not too distant future but we're we're working as it as it comes on a case-by-case -case basis and again the number one thing that a borrower can do is communicate with us so we can be proactive with them all right. Thank you, Gary. I'm going to get to a couple of more questions from our audience. One is, are capital energy improvements being considered to reduce tenants' operating expenses? And uh, Gary, I might uh, toss that one to you. Yeah, I would say that a lot of the new builds have a lot of the energy efficiency in them. But as far as a landlord going in now and, and paying extra money to do that is not likely, I would suspect. Uh, I would say that, um, you know, people are looking for saving their money right now as opposed to investing, especially when they not, might not get a return on it in the, in the near term. All you know, right. I think to add to that, I think what you're going to see is that landlord or landlords are going to have to start looking at improving air quality and circulation and in installing what they think might work as infrared inside duct work. Uh, do they have touchless uh, elevator entries? Do they have touchless wa uh, water in the bathrooms? Do they have ha uh, hands-free uh, paper dispensers? Those kind of things that they're gonna have to, to, to incorporate to entice client, uh, tenants to stay for one and to attract new ones. All right, thank you, Damien. Uh, next question, how will the demand for co-working and flex workspace be impacted by COVID-19? Who has thoughts on that? You know, I just, I mentioned that briefly in my presentation that collaborative open space, modern office space that's being built in the last five years is, is been the, the, the norm and the, the, where all the attention is. And they're beautiful spaces, don't get me wrong. But when you go to a social distancing environment, you got to ask yourself, is that what we really need in a social distancing atmosphere? And without a vaccination to make that a safe area, are we going to have that collaborative around a, 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 a area that's open uh, work environment? Or are we going to go back to what we used to have as the traditional office space, offices on the outside and uh, uh, space in the middle? It'll be interesting how that transforms over this time. And I think it's really dependent on where does this virus go? All right, thank you, Damien. And Mark, uh, another question from the audience. 
is there any form of surety bond which will guarantee a tenant's rent for the term of the lease? Mm -hmm. Sure, and I touched on that briefly in the presentation. I think, um, you know, there's not typically a performance or a payment bond that would be given in connection with that, like a bond you might see for a construction contract, but a standby letter of credit uh, serves that same function. And basically it's a financial instrument that's uh, prepared by an issuer that's typically a well-financed bank or financial institution. And it basically provides that in the event of a default, the um, issuer of the standby letter of credit would step in and perform the tenant's obligations and the tenant's obligations being primarily financial. Um, and so that's one way if you are concerned about um, and insufficiency of guarantors or insufficiency of uh, the financial um, uh, status of the tenant, that's a tool that landlords can use um, for, uh, you know, to ensure that the lease obligations are met. All right, thank you, Mark. And Gary, uh, we have a question from the audience about the long-term effects on the commercial furniture industry. Hmm. Um, coincidentally, I, I had coffee with um, a commercial furniture company yesterday, and he felt that they were at um, an advantage because not only do they provide new furniture, but they also provide used furniture. So it reminded me of going back to the Great Recession. Um, a lot of people are going to be fixing their cars versus buying new cars. Um, as you've seen during COVID, a lot of people are going to Home Depot and Lowe's and doing home improvement projects. So I think bottom line that anything that a lot of companies are doing that can help them save money, still get a very good product, but help them save money, why spend more than you have to, especially with the uncertainty going on? All right, and uh, I wanna ask each of you, uh, I might start with, um, uh, with Mark on this, but with all of the uncertainty about commercial real estate right now, especially with office and, and retail and, and, and hospitality, what will this do to demand and financing for new construction? Uh, I actually wrote a story a couple of weeks ago about a, a, an apartment project in Old Town Fort Collins that was under construction, lost its financing, and is now in, in foreclosure. But I'm just wondering as, as uh, these projects are, are considered during this time. There's, there are still construction projects that are uh, being announced or, or getting going. What, what is the demand uh, likely to be uh, here going forward uh, while we're still in this environment? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think right now it's, it, it takes time for the market forces to play out. In other words, a lot of the construction projects that are breaking ground today have been um, set in motion for quite some time. And, and um, but I think generally, if you are seeing increases in uh, rent defaults, that negatively impacts the uh, potential uh, value of a particular project and where the value proposition drops below a, a threshold where it just doesn't make sense to move forward, um, then uh, there can be a, a tendency to rethink and at least table projects until they, be, they can become financially viable. Where it gets more complex is where you've already secured uh, funding and secured a loan and have broken ground and have uh, vertical construction activities and you have um, basically started the construction project. And in those situations, I think if, it, if the... Uh, if there are no other defaults and if the construction project is on budget, then I think there's a tendency to, to finish the project and deal with the market forces and servicing the debt after. Um, I don't think there's much, uh, there's much of a push from lenders to cut off funding mid-construction in the absence of some other default out there. Um, but I think that certainly market forces are going to be pushing down valuations and are going to be hitting the bottom line for developers and, and where where it becomes uh, not feasible from a financial perspective i think you're, you're certainly going to see an impact all right gary thoughts on that uh, briefly we're uh, at the end of our time but we could take a brief response yeah i think mark um 
hit the nail on the head. I think that's um, a good summary. Um, again, case by case, you know, apartment buildings aren't an example of what we would typically go after, but um, in Colorado Springs, we had a member that we've worked with for a number of years, and uh, we financed a large uh, project that was uh, right before COVID, but if something is underway and we've already uh, worked with that member for a long time, uh, I, I would agree with Mark, we'd probably continue to work with that program. Damon, you have a quick, uh, yeah, quick when it When it comes to the construction market, the 18 month outlook is about a 20% decline in their backlog. That could be a, res a, a result of the amount of time it's taking to permit and entitle properties to get them moving, uh, the shortages of material, um, the, the changes in the way their people can go on site, uh, those kind of things. So in the construction industry, there is an anticipation that the amount of demand or their backlog, if you want to call it, of work in the next 18 months is going down and expected to go down about 20% overall. So that by itself indicates that there's going to be a slowdown. All right. Well, uh, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, we have reached the end of the time for this webinar. I want to thank uh, each of you again, uh, Mark and Damien and Gary, for providing your expertise for this program. And uh, uh, also thanking our sponsors, Berg Hill, Greenleaf, and Rashidi, and Credit Union, and Whipfleet. Thank you all very much. And I do want to have a couple, I have a couple of housekeeping notes. A survey will be sent to all attendees about the webinar today. So please uh, look for that and fill that out. And a archived recording link of this webinar will be sent to all attendees as well. We have a couple of upcoming events at BizWest, a webinar on building a stronger business through diversity. That will be on September 16th. And our Bixpo virtual B2B Expo, uh, this has changed. It, it will be on October 14th, not September 30th. So look for that on October 14th. And again, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, we greatly appreciate your time and thank you to all of our attendees as well. And we'll see you next time. Thanks everybody. <laughs>